Good morning. Thank you, Nancy, for introducing me here. And also thank uh, Conrad and Alex for inviting me, Helmut, that uh, I have opportunity to talk all of you here in Vancouver. I came once uh, or twice here, I remember, but I, uh, for the beautiful Whistler Mountain for skiing. That was, uh, it snows again here. So I, thought, I was told that it's unusual this time of the year, but uh, I wish you good luck. <laughs> with the weather, because Tokyo is so cold also, that because of the very strange uh, uh, snowfalls uh, happened week before, and we are in trouble. Today, I will talk about uh, the energy security issues for Japan, but also it relates to, to Canada in a way that uh, how the, the policy making uh, around the world suddenly interacting each other. That's what basically my message to my Japanese colleague, uh, because uh, I came back from um, Paris as the head of International Energy Agency. It was uh, uh, it was August in 2011, just a couple of months after the big tsunami and the Fukushima accident. And Japanese discussion about energy policy was so focused on the security or safety of the nuclear power plant. Of course, it is quite natural the public concern is on the radio activity uh, in the Fukushima or all Japan. But uh, since then, it's already about three years has passed. But a discussion now in Japan is uh, what is the best mix of energy policy? The zero nuclear, 10% nuclear, 20% nuclear, 30% nuclear, all depending on the very emotional reaction over the safety of the nuclear power. Yes, but many things is changing in, in the world, are changing in the world. That uh, the North American shale revolution in gas and light tight oil, the big change in the Middle East geopolitical stability, um, the Asian development uh, of demand for energy, all of these things must be given into the context of the Japanese policy making. And at the same time, it should be into the uh, Canadian energy policy making. So I tried to use the lots of materials from the IEA, World Energy Outlook 2013, and give you what is the context that we have to think about our energy policy of the future. Let me start with this chart. This is the uh, very common chart of the IEA's uh, energy demand uh, projections. OECD countries, developed countries, uh, demand is not really expanding. It's just uh, about only 4% of the global uh, growth toward 2035. The growth happens, as you can easily imagine, in Asia, China, India, ASEAN countries, and it counts about 65%. So. The, the, the suppliers of energy suddenly aiming at this market. Not only Asia, but Middle East will increase the demand dramatically thanks to the very cheap domestic price. It's a kind of subsidy and economic expansion there thanks to the very high oil price. In other places, Africa coming, uh, Latin America is coming and others. So. Emerging economies certainly is where the demand grows. Then what is the fuel mix which is uh, supplying this change? Well, good, for, good news for Canada is that uh, yes, fossil fuels still continue to be the major part of the supply. From now to 2035, the gas is certainly the big winner. The golden age of gas will come. That is what IEA has said some time ago when I was the head of IEA. And it will continue to be so. Yes, of course, renewables nuclear will expand. Even after Fukushima, IEA says that nuclear will expand about two thirds, means 66% from now to 2035, thanks to the demand in the emerging economies like China, India, etc. Renewables, yes, expand more than 80% because of the lots of the policy uh, initiatives in many countries. But the fossil fuel dependency will decline slightly from 82% now, but still it 
has 75% of the energy must come from fossil fuel. So the Canada, yes, certainly that is a great opportunity to supply these markets. By the way, because of this shale revolution and changes uh, in demand, who are the winners and losers in the global energy market is next chart. This chart shows energy import dependency of gas and oil by different countries. The right hand side and top, they are the major importers of gas and oil. India, China, they expand dramatically the, uh, the reliance on the gas and oil. Europe, the same thing. Japan and Korea just stay in 100% because we import already 100% of gas and oil, so we can never be worse, unfortunately, or fortunately. On the other hand, US shows totally different direction. Now it, it imports about 60% of oil, but it will decline less than 30 or about 20%, and US will be the gas exporter sometime soon. So this is, the US is definitely the winner, big winner in this energy change. ASEAN countries, yes, some of them are major producer of gas, like Indonesia, Malaysia, Brunei, but exportation capability will decline because they have to use it for domestic purposes. So Japan is importing about 40% of gas from ASEAN countries, but no longer possible in the future. We need to find some, somebody else. Africa, Australia, Canada, US, or Russia. And the countries of exporters stay in the green part, the left and bottom. The Canada is not shown here, but Canada is certainly one of the major importing uh, exporter of gas and oil. The, the Canada will expand its exportation of oil thanks to the oil sand. So it stays somewhere close to the other players, but expands the oil moving toward left while staying in, in the gas part. So the Canada is certainly Canada, Australia, or these countries big winners. Brazil it shows a huge difference, jump from the top left to the down, uh, top right from the down left, thanks to the offshore. So all these countries show the big differences. And for Japan, for example, if we do not have or we decide not to use nuclear power, how can we compete in this kind of change in the energy market? We don't have any oil, we don't have any gas, we don't have any coal. How can Japan compete in this kind of situation? That is what I am uh, prescribing toward Japanese public. Let's move to the shale revolution and its so-called energy independence of the Middle East, of the United States. In 2035, the oil will move to Asia, especially China and India. The 50% of oil moves uh, is exported from Middle East to Asia now, but it will expand to 90%. Most of the oil will, from the Middle East will go to Asia. While the United States will no longer need oil from Middle East, even though US will import from Saudi Arabia continuously because of the Saudi Aramco has a refinery in the United States, so they may export, but that means as a net, the US may start exporting oil not through Canada, but directly, because this is a big discussion in Washington, D.C. How do they liberalize the exportation of the crude? But this shows that certainly will U.S. continue to commit the peace in the Middle East or free navigation of the Strait of Hormuz? Or do they want China? India or other Asian countries to share the burden of protecting the sea lane. 
the Japanese discussion now in, in, in the Abe government or diet is that we have to think about so-called collective self-defense using the current treaty, US-Japan treaty, of helping both each other in the case very far away from Far East to the Middle East Sea Lane, like in Hormuz, by changing the interpretation of the Japanese constitution. This is a very contentious political issue, but certainly this energy change, market change, certainly stimulate Japan to go that kind of discussion of the geopolitical na nature. Holmuz, the Strait of Holmuz is always troublesome. If something happens there, the blockage, that stops about 17 uh, million BTU, uh, 17 million barrels per day of oil, about 30-40% of the trade of global oil and 85% of Japanese oil importation, 20% of the Japanese LNG imports. So, if something happens, and hopefully at this moment, this chance has been declined, and I hope this will be solved peacefully, but something happens, like Israel attack over the uh, Iranian nuclear facility, the stoppage or blockage may happen, and that may cause the huge trigger in the Japanese uh, economic uh, downtown. I calculated just uh, simply if the price of oil will move up to $160 per barrel, the Japanese uh, trade account surplus has disappeared already thanks to we are spending about 40 billion US dollars of extra uh, oil and gas importation. So we have huge trade deficit now. But current account surplus also disappear very quickly if this continues and if we don't have nuclear power running, this may cause the huge uh, credit uh, problem or, 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 or onto the Japanese government bond as well as yen. So Abenomics is moving Japanese yen weaker and it helps exportation, but this is the crisis which could be triggered by the Iranian situation. Just IA has about 16 billion barrels of public stockpile, and this could be utilized in case of emergency. If it is 2 million barrels per day release, it, uh, IA can sustain about 24 months, two years. If it is 4 million barrels per day, like fast oil shock in 1974, then it can sustain about 12 months, about a year. But it, the, 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 the whole most stoppage, blockage is 13 million barrels per day and no way to maintain even a couple of months or 13 million barrels per day release is practically impossible. China is doing a little more cautious but very dynamically trying to secure their resource importation, mainly through pipeline. China has built a pipeline from Turkmenistan for gas, uh, from Kazakhstan for oil, from Russia by oil. Their gas pipeline could be built with Russia if they come to the agreement of the prices, even though it, is, it, could, it seems very difficult. Uh, already pipeline between Myanmar and uh, southern China has uh, built. So China's policy of energy security is building pipeline and try to get oil gas through pipeline. Of course, sea lane is important uh, for oil and LNG, but certainly it is costly in terms of the sea lane defense. They are very assertive of sending uh, aircraft carriers, missile uh, defense, uh, submarines. So this chart, this map is created by United States Defense Department as a re China report to the Congress. So this clearly shows the geopolitical implication of the China's action of defending Silane. 
some implication of oil uh, energy independence of the United States to the IEA's preparedness or influence of to the market, because thanks to the oil, uh, uh, let's say, importation reduction in the OECD countries as uh, economy grows in the U.S. independence, the significant uh, decline of importation of the OECD countries will appear toward 2035. While importation to China, India will grow much, much faster. So close to the 2020s, a little over 2020, that position of China, India will certainly surpass that of OECD combined. So if IEA decides to release stocks of oil, but if China and India just swallow it, the influence will be minimum. So need to engage. My job at the IEA was to engage China and India as much as possible to the IEA work. Even uh, official membership to join the IEA is probably necessary. Well, they are cautious because IA was created as a geopolitical institution after the fast oil shock, facing the challenge from the OPEC. So China is trying to cooperate, but they don't want, China and India do not want to tie their hands with the action of the IA. Let's move to what would happen in the future about the oil uh, market. The two chapters means before 2025 and after 2025 toward 2035. The yellow part shows the after, the red part shows before. Certainly light tight oil, second from the bottom, shows that the expansion will uh, continue toward 2035 but after, the yellow part is into the negative side. While oil sand from Canada, or very heavy oil from Venezuela, will continue to expand after 2025. But the important point is that the dependency to the Middle East conventional oil will expand. So at this moment, the plan for light tight oil in the U.S. will diminish while the dependency on the Middle East will increase. So we should, we should not be complacent about the share revolution in the North America. We must be careful about the risk or instability of the Middle East in the future. That is a new message of the IEA in the last World Energy Outlook. Let's move to the gas. This is a gas uh, production uh, increase. Uh, the largest increase would happen in China, especially later toward 2035, thanks to the shale revolution uh, and Corbett methane in China. Still there are problems in China. We know that the, uh, the shale layer is deeper while it's different from the structure, it's different from the North America. They have shortage of available water for the fracturing. They have the problem, they don't have pipeline system or yet de developed. They have the price control of electricity and gas. They don't have very small independent producers. So there are many of the issues of China as a problem, but China, Chinese government, especially NDLC, is very strongly committed for developing gas or shale gas, especially because of air pollution. Not only CO2 emission, but shale uh, uh, gas, uh, excuse me, uh, the, the, the air pollution due to the coal was, is so bad that Chinese government try very hard. I visited uh, the shale well, the first shale gas well in the Sichuan uh, province uh, in China. And they are continuously uh, developing and they're very optimistic in the future. So in their 12th uh, five-year plan, it's clear that China is committed to very strong increase 
and this will happen. So that is certainly one element of uh, the production. In, in uh, the, the Canada is not in this chart because Canadian conventional gas production will decline while the shale gas uh, production will increase. So in terms of only shale gas uh, production, the Canada is the third next to US and China, and then Canada's production expands uh, very dramatically. So Canada certainly play a very important player in the gas, uh, shale gas uh, sector. On the other hand, conventional player of Russia for Asian countries, especially Japan, is also important. Russian's policy is using West Siberian gas uh, providing through pipeline to Europe. Ukraine is certainly the problematic now. While the, uh, because of the European demand is, has weakened, and also the possibility of exportation from Middle East gas to Europe, and also they are importing coal from United States thanks to the shale revolution, the Russian gas uh, exportation to Europe has declined dramatically in recent years. So, Russia is aiming at more expanding Asia, Japan, Korea, China, eventually. So, developing more the East Siberian gas wells and connecting it by pipeline. Currently, Japan imports about 10% of gas from Russia, from Sakhalin. Maybe Russia is interested in exporting gas by uh, LNG because of uh, diversification of the way and more value added. But also for Japan, we are just importing LNG, or only LNG uh, for gas, but maybe pipeline connection with Russia could be uh, considered as a diversification of the uh, method. Uh, currently, only uh, LNG project is considered in Vladivostok, but Vladivostok to Japan is just 800 kilometers. From Sakhalin, North from Sakhalin to northern part of uh, Hokkaido, it's about 800 kilometers also. So it's quite short distance. So maybe, in my view, that um, no, rather than LNG, pipeline could be cheaper. And pipeline certainly is one way of uh, diversifying the Japanese importation, so strategic uh, thinking is necessary. Russia wants to sell Jap first Japan before China and sh tell China that, well, if you don't want to buy at a certain price, Japan will take it. This kind of strategy is there. And Russian concern about uh, Chinese immigration or illegal immigrants in the East Siberia is another geopolitical issue which Russia wants Japanese cooperation. Yes, there are Northern Island issue, Northern Territory issue. Who knows what would happen, but certainly this is very interesting time between Japan and Russia to f move further economic collaboration thanks to the very close relation with Abe and, and Putin at this time. Price of gas. This is interest for, of course, to you. And before Shea Revolution, North American, Japanese, uh, or European gas trends are more or less similar, except some kind of sharp up and down in the Henry Hub price. But after Shea Revolution, there are three different zones of gas. The Japan or Asian premium is there because of the long-term contracts uh, linking to the oil price and also recent uh, situation after Fukushima, Japan is huge amount of gas. So the uh, spot price is very high. While Europe is more uh, competitive in the nature of using gas pipeline and LNG and market in London and uh, Berlin helps them to make the price in the middle of two zones. 
US is very based on Henley Hub market. So Japanese price is about five times or six times than US. The European price is about three times. Why US market is so cheap? One reason that IEA raised was this liquid content issue. If the liquid content uh, or condensate or natural gas liquid come out of the, come with gas, yes, of course, it, it can be sold in, in the oil price. So wet gas is precious than dry gas. So if it's more wet, you gain, and gas could be sold to the market for free, or even burned it if necessary, if there is no pipeline, the flaring happens as such. So this situation push the gas price down where, while oil price is moving up. The higher the oil price, the lower the gas price. That is happening in the North America. On the other hand, Japan is still linking the gas price to the very high oil price, and this will certainly cause competitiveness issue in Japan or in Asia. How can we change the gas formula of delinking to the oil price rather to the market or some other form, uh, hybrid of market and uh, oil pricing? This is a big issue now in Japan. After Fukushima, the utilities can no longer continue to charge back to the consumers of the higher cost. They are forced to, to reduce the cost of electricity or gas as much as possible. It's a political reality and economic uh, necessity. So the government is pushing the companies to get the best deal from around the world. It is called top runner or a front runner approach. If some company gets the best deal, the government pushes the others to do the same. So this kind of pressure, downward pressure of the gas demand exists now in Japan. US exportation may give us the chance of renegotiating the price. After, well, oil pri uh, the gas price in the US will eventually move up. Close to currently uh, three, four dollars, it may move up to five, six dollars. But also on top of that, liquefaction and transportation costs be levied, five dollars, six dollars. So maybe, but still the possible price of export from US be calculated by IEA about 10, 11 dollars per million BTU. So it's much lower than 15, 16 dollars per million BTU currently Japan is paying. Yes, this is very challenging uh, figure, but this gives a good opportunity for Japan to renegotiate with current producers or current suppliers toward lower price. Another thing is what IA told us is that destination limitation or restriction clauses and some other inefficient trade causes about $10 billion of burden onto the Japanese importation. $10 billion a year, it's a huge amount. So currently Japanese uh, long-term contract has a clause called destination restriction. So Japanese importer cannot sell the LNG to somebody else on the way to Japan. But that prevents creating the gas market in Asia. So the government is also pushing very hard to have the diversified, uh, let's say, uh, route like pipelines and creating uh, the hub of market in Asia. That helps probably reducing the price of gas in the future. Another chart, this is created by IEEJ, the Institute of Econom Energy Economics in Japan, is the uh, hypothetical impact of restarting of nuclear power plant and US exportation to the Japanese LNG importation price. The blue line is the cost curve of Japanese importation as of 2012. The long-term price 
uh, range from five dollars to more than twenty. Twenty is probably the uh, more the spot price. But if the restarting of nuclear power plant happens, yes, some reduction of the importation and also 15 million tons of uh, LNG from US happens, suddenly it pressure down the price. So yes, this is not easy, but suddenly restarting of the nuclear power plant is another big element in Japan. Nobody knows when the restarting happens. The newly created uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission is now uh, investigating about 17 reactors which are posted by the utilities for check. Some of them may restart before summer because summer is a peak time and we may have serious problem if reactors running in some of the companies like Kep uh, Kansai or Kyushu will face serious threat of shortage of electricity. So the new re uh, regulatory commission decided they will focus on one or two or three reactor sites to make a, a quick uh, check and make it possible of restarting it. Still, this is very, very politicized and emo emotional issue. So it's very difficult to make prediction. But we hope that this restarting will happen gradually. The IEA tells us about what would be the future price of LNG or gas. And they are saying that uh, two price zones may appear because Japanese price, thanks to the restarting of nuclear power plant and uh, more diversified sources from US, Canada, or Australia, etc., the price will gradually decline and coming closer to European price, while US price will increase thanks to the market or demand increase. But uh, still, this shows the gap between Japanese price and American price. Japanese price is still more than or about double of the US price. And for the competitiveness sake, certainly it is handicapped. So what another, one of the way to reduce, uh, or at least to uh, reduce the impact of price gap is some technology, which Japanese government is now serious about is hydrogen. Just get rid of the carbon or CO2, carbon dioxide, at the production side, producer side, by the CCS, and make it clean energy, and import it through different uh, technologies. This shows the Chioda chemicals, chemical hydrate method, using toluene and adding hydrogen components to make it MCH, methyl cyclohexane. Methyl cyclohexane is liquid under normal temperature and pressure. So they can ship it by regular oil tanker and store it in the regular oil tanks. So rather than building LNG uh, facility or LNG tankers, this may provide a much cheaper way of transportation and storage of hydrogen. So if hydrogen be given the feed-in tariffs or some premiums thanks to the carbon tax, then this business model may work. And there are other methodology of transportation, liquefied hydrogen or ammonium, liquid ammonia. There are many different uh, technological breakthrough possible. So hydrogen economy, yes, it is happening thanks to the fuel cell vehicle of Toyota coming next year. But if infrastructure of hydrogen station is always very important and technology may help Japan to reinvigorate the hydrogen economy. Another one is this methane hydrate. Maybe you have heard about the Japanese Jogmek succeeded in getting it uh, from underwater in March last year and ignited. it. Yes, this picture created a huge impact in many places where I visited. I was always asked the question, Mr. Tanaka, when methane hydrate will come to be a commercially viable? 
IEA this year, uh, last year, excuse me, in the uh, World Energy Outlook, it is cited in this kind of red uh, characters. And uh, the potential of methane hydrate is about 10 to 100 times as plentiful as the US shale gas reserves, with the huge reserves possible. But of course, production need technology and Japanese governments aims to achieve commercial production in 10 to 15 years. Well, we need still the 10 to 15 years to late 2020s. That is what IEA says. We may take time, but certainly, depending on the gas price, oil price, this technology could be a next unconventional gas source. Let's think about uh, electricity. Yes, electric electrification. Energy demand grows by 30% from now to 2035 as a whole, while electricity generation grows by 70%. So uh, not only, uh, I would say, in the developed economy, but in a, many developing countries use much, much more electrification, electricity. But they come from coal. This is another huge environmental challenge. Uh, and also renewables and gas. So this is the source of electrification. But the problem is this renewable. Renewable is very important, uh, indigenous source and also clean, but subsidy is a problem. The IEA calculate about $4.7 trillion of subsidy needed by 2035. In OECD countries, Europe leads, but China also spent huge amount of subsidy for renewables. IEA predicts the mix of power mix of Japan as this. After Fukushima, nuclear becomes almost uh, came to zero. Currently, there is no reactors running in Japan, so it's zero. But it's expand, it's come back gradually toward about 20 percent. But it will not expand because restart uh, uh, building new power plant, nuclear power plant, would be very difficult. So, uh, IA predict. After 40 years, maybe gradual decommissioning happening. So toward 2035, about 15%, 1.5% of electricity be generated by nuclear. The major increase happens in the renewables. It will expand to about 25%. And then gas, about a third, and about a quarter by coal. Oil is too expensive. Currently, we are importing huge amount of oil for electricity, but this will gradually uh, slow down. But what does this mean for the energy cost? The IEA made a very uh, unique uh, analysis uh, last year. This is the current, uh, 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 no, excuse me, 2003, a, a little 10 years ago, the, the cost of gas. Japan is paying certainly very higher cost than the US, but uh, less than two, two times. It expands dramatically uh, currently. It's about 4.5 or about five times more price of gas. Europe is about three, twice more than, about three times more than the United States. Let's see the electricity. Uh, it will go down because the Japanese nuclear power plant will restart uh, and more renewables. But uh, so the demand for uh, gas expands, but slowly expansion of the production happens. So price will go down, but still the Japanese import price is two, more than 2%, about 2%. times, excuse me, 2.5 times more than the US price. Europe, China, about two, two, two times, twice more. And electricity. This is the electricity price in 2003. It is high, but in 2035, yes, it went, currently, Japan, Japanese industry is paying about three times more of 
the electricity price than the US. The Canadian price is much less, thanks to the hydro. European price is about double of US price. In 2035, thanks to the restarting of nuclear power plant, Japanese price comes down slightly, while European price is much higher than Japanese, thanks to the renewable energy source. So the configuration of the uh, electricity makes the difference in the energy price. And what does this mean for the competitiveness of industry? That is the new report of IEA. This is one chapter of US petrochemical renaissance is happening. The ethylene, cent ethylene centers are being built in the US. It used to be the case for India, China, or Middle East, but it moved to the US thanks to the very cheap input by gas. So in f as for the uh, ex exportation competitiveness, the IEA says that the winners of Energy intensive export means petrochemicals, cement, or steel at iron is expanding in China, of course, Middle East, India, but also from the United States. And winners are Europe and Japan. Yes, I remember that uh, European leaders of Van Lompi uh, and uh, Mr. Barroso of the Commission came to Japan and uh, I was invited for lunch with them and they show a very serious concern about the relative competitiveness of your European industry vis-a-vis -vis US. And they asked me the question, how about Japan? Can Japan, Japanese industry compete with no nuclear power? That is thank you to their concern, but Japanese discussion of the nuclear future is very negative. So I am showing the com real concern about our energy mix of the future. What about nuclear? Nuclear power will increase in China or developing economy and also East Europe because East Europe needs to reduce coal consumption because of their targets of CO2 emission reduction, and also the challenge to reduce dependency from Russia. So East Europe, like Hungary, Poland, Czech, Slovak, Finland, are trying to use nuclear. But my point about nuclear is make it safer. Just we learned a lesson in Fukushima, and this lesson must be shared. The major lesson is that the Fukushima accident was caused by human error, unfortunately, and could have been avoided. That's all the reports of the Japanese uh, investigative commission are similar. But on what kind of specific uh, mistakes they made, one easy way to understand is that Fukushima Daiichi was caused meltdown, but the similar reactor site, which was attacked by the earthquake and tsunami were okay. Like Fukushima Daini, the second Fukushima power plant, or Onagawa plant, or Tokai Daini plant. These are located in the Pacific North Coast, East Coast, and they were safe because some of the reactor site was built more than 10 meters higher thanks to the concern of the company architecture and also some reactor site finished the uh, repairment of the w higher walls just by two days they completed the uh, say uh, the construction just the march 9th and avoided this meltdown so the god helps those who help themselves even though this is the very critical issue of which we have learned, but unfortunately, this kind of lesson cannot be shared so well yet. And I am urging Japanese companies, utilities, or governments to share the lesson clearly, what mistakes we made. And without showing that, 
the nuclear future is very shaky. One of the technologies may help. I talked a little bit of this integral fast reactor, which was uh, uh, developed by Algon National Laboratory some time ago in the United States. Maybe you have heard a movie called Pandora's Promise, directed by Robert Stone. It was uh, broadcasted in the CNN last November. And also it was released at the beginning of last year at the Sundance Film Festival and caused a big uh, would say, uh, focus of uh, people. And this movie is uh, the documentary of uh, featuring about four or five people who are the very hard greens who change their views after uh, learning about the details of the nuclear power, radioactivity, etc. That nuclear power is necessary to overcome the climate change mitigation together with economic growth in the developing economies. So this movie I was told that 80% of those who were against, who saw the movie, changed their views. Americans are relatively optimistic people. Japanese are pessimistic after Fukushima. So it cannot be as such, but give very good opportunities of thinking about the nuclear power. And in the movie, this technology of integral fast reactor was introduced. And the movie concentrate on the experiment in 1986 when this uh, reactor was tested and the kind of uh, total plant blackout situation. And this reactor was uh, stopped automatically without any human intervention. So it proven the passive safety feature. Also, it has very interesting feature of high-level waste management. Usually, light water reactor, uh, uh, spent fuel, and high-level waste from that. We need about 100,000 years to diminish radioactivity, while this one is just 300 years. 300 years is fairly long for human life, but compared to 100,000 years, this could be much more manageable by storage or uh, geological uh, disposal. So there are big discussion in Japan what we should do about fuel cycle. Monju, Fukushima, uh, Rokkasho, these are the big discuss another discussion than the safety issue. We need light water reactor system. Yes, it was OK when it was used as a submarine uh, drives. Because if accident happens, OK, get rid of them under the water because it stops with water. Light water reactor system is designed as such. While light water system put onto the land has certain risk. Unfortunately, Fukushima proved. So we need to go to more research of safer, passive safety or manageable waste or non-proliferation, proliferation, resistant system of nuclear technology. That is what probably this time we need, Japan should do more. GE has developed S-PRISM for this technology already. Korea is aiming at this technology seriously because Korea do not, uh, is not allowed yet to do the reprocessing. So Korea is asking bilateral one, two, three agreement revision with US of incorporating pyro processing or reprocessing to Korea. They're asking, if Japan can do it, why not Korea? If Korea is starting, yes, certainly Japan, we may have some issues of geopolitical nature. Mr. John Nye, Richard Armitage made a report, very strong report, about a year ago. If Japan phase out nuclear, is Japan giving up the first tier nation status? That, they said, very strong word. But nuclear is not only the cheap 
safe electricity. It has geopolitical, technological implication, which we didn't discuss after the war. So unfortunately or fortunately, with Fukushima incident, we are forced to, to start discussing this kind of issue to determine the future of nuclear power for Japan. Re uh, sustainability about the energy is another issue, which I don't want to spend too much time. But it's getting more and more difficult without non-OECD countries. And the carbon budget will be getting less and less in the future. We don't have much time and space left to for the solution which we have to aim at in France in 2015. IEA prescribed the 450 ppm scenario, which leads us to the two degrees Celsius scenario by doing a lot. We need everything, CCS, energy efficiency, renewables, nuclear. But the consequence of this technology is enormous. This gray part is what we have now. The blue part is what we are likely to have as new policy scenario. But to achieve 450, we need as high as green. That is what this chart shows. But what does this practically mean? We must build 16 gigawatt of nuclear power every year from now to 2050. 16 gigawatt means 16 one gigawatt nuclear power plant every year. Can we do that? Can we build 60 gigawatts of wind power? We have to build 50 gigawatts of solar power every year. And carbon price of making this happen is $120 per ton of the CO2. So it's very challenging. It's not impossible, but it's very difficult. Well, final point of my statement is energy security can be achieved by diversity and connectivity and probably compensated a little bit by nuclear. Because this chart shows that the importing, energy importing country ranked by either fossil fuel or renewables. And those countries who has less fossil fuel and renewables is compensating it by nu using nuclear. That's a yellow part. So different countries, and especially European, I mean, those countries who are exporter, like Canada, are above 100%. So I didn't put them there, like Russia, Canada, Norway, Australia, or Middle East countries. The Europe is very peculiar. Europe has very different countries. Poland is mainly on uh, coal. Sweden is hydro and nuclear. Germany is uh, divided for three, but phasing out nuclear. Italy has only some uh, renewables like hydro and gas. The France has very little fossil fuel, but some renewables and mainly nuclear power. So Europe, as a average, is second from the bottom, shows that uh, self-sufficiency rate is about 50%, and very much well balanced by the different sources. But it is not, up, not only average, because European countries connecting each other by grid lines and pipelines to create one big market. So actually, Germany can phase out nuclear because they can buy power, if necessary, from France, generated by nuclear, or from Poland, by generated by coal. So this is, I call it a collective energy security. And this energy, collective energy security and sustainability be a model for Asia. This is my next question. European gas pipeline system, European grid connection system, and it is European system is now expanding to North Africa, thanks to the high 
voltage direct current line project of Siemens. It is called Desatec. Of course, this is getting uh, 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 somewhat slowed down because of the Arab Spring in Tunisia or Libya or Egyptian situation. But certainly, this is a very visionary networking of the grid. In terms of Japan, yes, some guy called uh, Masayoshi Son, he's the head of CEO of the SoftBank, is prescribing the concept called Asian Supergrid. He's interested in importing solar or wind power from Mongolia by connecting Japanese grid lines through China and Korea. Russia wishes to export electricity generated by hydro to Japan by connecting grid lines. So already China is importing electricity from Russia and exporting electricity to Vietnam. So Asian supergrid to some extent is happening except Japan. Pipeline, same thing. Um, this chart is prepared by the Japanese professor Hirata some time ago. And what was actually uh, materialized is only in China. And Chinese uh, experts, uh, I was invited to this uh, f forum for North East Asian gas pipeline infrastructure, consisted of uh, Russia, Mongolia, China, Korea, Japan experts. And Chinese experts are always very thankful for this Professor Hirata for his concept or design. And asking that Korea, uh, already many things is happening in China in the domestic pipelines, international pipeline like uh, from Turkmenistan, from Myanmar. What is Japan doing? Japan is still isolated out from the system in Asia. The system, networking system in Asia is growing. Can Japan stay outside of it? Or should we stay outside of it and by just importing LNGs? Will it increase the energy security? This is my question to my Japanese colleague. And we don't have to waste our time by disputing over small islands or rocks between Korea and China. Of course, there are more problems in domestic. Our pipeline system is very underdeveloped. We don't have really big pipeline system in Japan for gas. We don't have grid connection in Japan, the east-west, we have different frequency zones. Japan is two, two different markets. This caused the blackout in the east when Fukushima accident happens. IEA cautioned the possibility of this kind of risk for years and years. Japan didn't learn until March 11th. Still, they are not changing this system. So I'm very much concerned of this complacency. So in the end, this is a kind of comprehensiveness of the energy security is getting more and more important, which helps sustainability at the same time. IEA was created in 1974 for oil shock, having the petroleum stockpile and use it in case of emergency, Hurricane Katrina, Rita, or desert uh, storm, Gulf War, or Libyan crisis. Yes. Petroleum is important for auto industry, automobile society, and it is a 20th century energy security. The 21st century is, as I said, electrification. How to secure the electricity from the different sources, renewables, nuclear, coal, gas, oil, energy efficiency, demand side management, smart grid is getting more and more important for the demand side control. So this comprehensive energy security and sustainability is a key issue for everybody. And depending on their uh, situation or resource allocation, we have to think about how can we best contribute to the sustainability and energy security of the global community. Thank you very much for providing me the opportunity to talk all of you. I am always open for any questions later. Thank you very much.